Good morning. Welcome to our worship service for the Ebenezer Presbyterian Church. It's wonderful to have you watching us uh, online this morning. Uh, we do want to welcome not just our members at Ebenezer, but also if you are a guest with us, perhaps somebody sent you a link to our service today, or maybe you just happened to find us uh, online. Uh, we're glad that you are here and look forward to the time when uh, this is passed and we're able to be back together again in our sanctuary uh, at Ebenezer and hope that you'll join us then as well and give us a chance to greet you and welcome you to the church. There are a couple announcements I do want to uh, point out before our worship service uh, begins. Uh, first, uh, we will not have a Maundy Thursday worship service this week. Instead, uh, we will have a devotional that will be posted uh, for the congregation for Good Friday. It will be posted uh, before Friday so that you'll have access to it and hope that you'll use it for your own personal devotional time or perhaps for your family worship time as well. Uh, second, uh, Dr. Leslie Holmes, who is the moderator of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, has called for a day of fasting and prayer uh, on Friday. And you'll be getting more information about that uh, through emails in the week ahead. Uh, but this is a day of fasting and prayer that is uh, going to be done in conjunction with some sister denominations, the Presbyterian Church in America, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, as well as the Anglican Church of North America. And so again, please stay tuned. Uh, look for emails that will provide more information about that. Uh, but it is a, a wonderful occasion for us to come before the Lord, humble ourselves before him in fasting and in praying and seeking his face. Now let us prepare ourselves to worship the Lord. As the psalmist tells us, so magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together.
Let's join together in prayer. Great Father, though we are in different places, we ask you to gather us together now before your throne of grace with that great cloud of witnesses and the hosts of heaven who are forever praising you. Please prompt our worship and lead us by your Holy Spirit. May the songs that we sing exalt you. May the prayers that we offer rise up to you like incense, a sweet-smelling aroma, and with humble hearts cause us to listen attentively to your word preached over us. So the gospel is once again proclaimed from this pulpit, and Christ is lifted up that all men may see him and believe in him. O Lord, inhabit, we pray, the worship of your people, for you alone are worthy of our praise. Amen. Let's join together and sing, All Glory, Loud, and Honor. Let's join together and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Our most majestic God, holy are you and righteous in all of your ways. You alone are sovereign and reign without rival over all of your creation. All things owe their existence to you, and we whom you have created in your image confess that it is in you we live and we move and we have our being. Father, we come before you now in unusual times, and how important it is for us to rightly interpret your acts of providence. In your word, you warned Israel of national calamities that would come due to the people's disobedience. And while we are not ancient Israel, you are still the God of holiness and justice who 
does not look with indifference upon our sin. We confess to you that we have loved your gifts more than we have loved you, the giver. We have established for ourselves functional idols of our hearts, things that we look to instead of you for security and purpose and even our identity. And when those things are threatened, we are filled with fear. We've put our trust in worldly things like economies and military and medicine and technology instead of you. A pandemic like the one that we face exposes our misplaced confidence. Even now, it is our tendency to look to science and the medical community for hope instead of humbling ourselves before you and crying out for mercy and hallowing your name and seeking your face. Father, please forgive us for how we have provoked you and tested your long-suffering patience. Please forgive us for our sinfulness as a nation and how we have turned against you. Forgive your church for its lukewarm faith and witness. And forgive us individually for how we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. O God, please grant to us a deep contrition and a godly sorrow that leads to repentance And meet our repentance with your grace in Jesus Christ, whose blood alone can cover our sins and wash us clean. We ask you to purify your church that has slumbered far too long, and purify its pulpits that have abandoned your true word. Stir up the winds of revival through your Holy Spirit as you have in the past, and call us as a nation to yourself in faith. Lift up Christ in his glorious cross that we would be drawn to him. Prompt us to cast aside our worthless idols that we would desire you above all else. And we pray that these United States would become an epicenter from which your Holy Spirit moves throughout this world around us and among the nations. That you and you alone would become the object of all glory and honor and praise. Father, we do pray for our president, our vice president, and our government leaders down to the local level. We ask you to give them wisdom and guidance. We pray for health care workers and first responders who tend to those in need. We ask that you would protect them. We pray for those who have this virus, and we ask you to preserve their lives. We pray for so many who have lost loved ones and ask that you would comfort them. We pray for others who have lost their jobs, even within our church family, and ask you to sustain them in the times ahead. Let them see that you are the faithful, covenant-keeping God who will not forsake your own in their times of need. And Father, we continue to pray for our Ebenezer church family. It is hard for us to be separated from one another. We so very much miss seeing our brothers and sisters in Christ. We miss our opportunity to worship together. We miss our fellowship. We pray for a quick end to the present circumstances so that we may gather together once again. But in the meantime, make us attentive to one another in simple ways that keep our connections. A phone call, a note, a simple expression of care. Please guide our elders and our pastors as they shepherd your people. Instruct our deacons as they tend to the needs of the saints. Lead our staff to discern creative ways that we can continue to carry out our ministries. And cultivate within our homes regular times of family worship. Father, largely because of our busyness, we have neglected this area. But what a blessing it would be if out of this present trial, you brought parents to reestablish the family altar, and fathers especially would reclaim their ministry to serve as a prophet, teaching their household your word, and a priest praying for and interceding on behalf of their families, and a king protecting their families and leading them daily to your throne of grace. Father, please make it so. O oh God, we thank you for hearing our prayers as we offer them in faith, and thank you for hearing the prayers of Christ himself, our great high priest, as he intercedes on our behalf. It is through him that we pray. Amen.
good to begin with you this Lord's Day, and I'll ask if you've got a copy of the Holy Scriptures to turn to the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12. We'll be considering together the, triumph for, the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll begin reading this text from the 12th verse and following. Follow along as I read. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we begin. Oh God, our Father, we humble ourselves even this day as we enter into an audience before you and at your throne of grace we come and we ask that you would be gracious to us not on the purpose of our own merit do we come but resting in the confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ who has shed his own blood for our souls and so to that end we pray would you uncover our eyes and unstop our ears would you show us the truth of the word proclaimed this day May the power and presence of the Holy Spirit grant to us that which we could see only with his help. And we pray this for Jesus' sake and glory alone. Amen. Jesus Christ began his ministry in the wake of the imprisonment of John the Baptizer. What a ministry it was. He started that ministry with this proclamation. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, believe the gospel. With that declaration came a ministry that was beyond anything they had ever seen and anything they had ever hoped to see. I want to ask you a question. What would it be like to have been there? What would it have been like to see firsthand the glories of that ministry? Think of it now in your mind's eye. 
You were there when Jesus reached out and touched the man with a withered hand. You were there when the mute man had his tongue loosed. You were there when the deaf could hear. You were there when he fed the 5,000 and then the 4,000 to follow. You were there. You felt that glory. The kingdom of God came near. I imagine it would breed an excitement, wouldn't it? Sense of anticipation. Each day that you came to be with your Lord and Master, you'd think, what's today? He's calmed the wind and the wave. He's broken the back of the demonic. What's today? Freedom from Mary Magdalene. New life to Lazarus. Widow of Nain receives her son back from the dead. What will it be like today? There can't be any doubt that the excitement surrounding the Lord Jesus' ministry was palpable. I imagine those people, as they followed him day in and day out, had this sense. They could hear Jesus' promise, declaration ringing in their ears. The time is at hand. The kingdom has come. I don't think it's any wonder that that day in Jerusalem, as the Passover approached, and the people are pouring into the city for the feast and all the festivities, they're looking for the Lord Jesus. They're asking among themselves, Have you seen him? Is he here? Do you think he'll come? It's where our text begins. I've got a copy of the scriptures. I'm going to ask you to look to verse 12 as we begin. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. I'm sure that was quite a crowd. You can almost feel the pulse beat of the excitement. The poor are there. The rich are there. The religious types are there. The people who are genuinely hungry for God. They're all there. And they're all pressing into Jerusalem and they're all looking for the Christ. Where's Jesus? Where's that itinerant preacher? What will it be today? Healings, deliverance, maybe even freedom from the Romans. Or maybe, just maybe, Jesus is Messiah. The one that we've been promised for so long. They had their expectations. They had their beliefs. They had their great desires. But as we look at this text in the opening verse, I want to come to our first of observations, and it's this. Be careful for expectations. They often set you up for disappointment. Many leaders had surfaced in Palestine prior to the Lord Jesus. All of them promised freedom from Rome. All of them promised spiritual insight. And so it was a given that the people had an expectation for Jesus came. But when we have expectations, they lead us into ways of thinking which are grandiose and self-serving and not always in line with the will of God. The people surrounding Jesus that day on this triumphal entry were just like you and me. They had dreams. They had aspirations. They had goals for their families and for themselves. But expectations can lead to misbeliefs as well. Expectations can be a heady thing. They can sometimes push you out ahead of God's will. Expectations can have a kernel of truth at the center and then this ornate and elaborate ring of lies built up around it. Expectations suggest to us one thing when God's perspective is quite another. That's where these people found themselves this day in Jerusalem as Jesus was about to ride in. He was their Messiah. He was their king, but... He was very different than what they were expecting. These people expected that their Messiah would be a liberator, military hero. They had had the boot of Rome on their throat for all so many years. And they were looking for someone who could liberate them and to grant to them the freedom that they felt they so richly deserved. But Jesus didn't come as a liberator. He came as a suffering servant. They had another expectation of their Messiah, that he'd be strong, he'd be vibrant. This one came meek and mild, offering them a similar yoke. These people expected that their Messiah would kill others and would rule by the sword, but Jesus came and was himself killed on a Roman cross. Those expectations had failed to be informed by the scriptures, and as such, this people was walking in ignorance. I wonder if you and I need to guard ourselves against expectations about the Lord Jesus 
which are not based on the biblical text. Now, we have our ideas about the Lord Jesus based on tradition, based on familiarity, sometimes even based on superstition. But what are you anticipating about the Lord this day in your life and in the days to come? Are your expectations biblical or are they something of your own planning? Again, this people was walking in ignorance. Well, our story continues. The excitement is building and all at once there's an outbreak, thankfully not of violence, but of worship. Look to verse 13, would you? So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. This leads me to our second observation, which is this. The heartfelt response in worship is the best response. Palm branches, really? It seems so odd. How is that somehow a place of honor? Well, it's odd to us, but it's obvious for the people of that day. You see, the palm was the queen of all the lowland trees. Some of them lived over 200 years. They were replenished with life, evergreen, and they had this majestic set of fronds about the top of the plant, almost like a crown. And beyond all this, to the thirsty desert traveler, the palm was often the site of hope itself. One of the German commentators that I read this week said, in many an oasis, the palm was the picture of life in the world of death. Oh, that's telling, isn't it? What these people had been fed for so many years was the dried up, dusty religion of the Pharisees, full of law, full of regulations, not even the hint of grace. But here is Jesus, and he's so much the opposite. He's the picture of eternal life, resplendent, crowned with honor, alive, much like the palm. He doesn't break the bruised reed, he's tender with it. He doesn't quench the smoking wick, he guards it. Unlike the Pharisees, he's affirming, he's forgiving, he's full of love, even for those who hate him. No wonder these people were excited for the coming of Jesus. And no wonder they're breaking these palm branches off at the joy of his coming. And you remember their voices. They're not sitting there idly, waving their palm branches in some sort of a stay, stalid, calm way. Not at all. They're raising their voices and they're shouting out, Hashana, Hashana, Shaphahel, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. It's interesting, Luke's gospel gives us a little bit of a broader view of what's happening just here. And he writes these verses about this event. Luke writes, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. We'll say it again. Heartfelt worship is the best response. Let me ask you a question as we're looking at these people and all that they're doing by way of their worship. When it comes to worship, what's your posture? I don't mean on the outside, I mean on the inside. What's your posture? What's the posture of your heart? How do you approach worship? Well, these people acted out what they felt. Their outside matches their inside. That's good when it comes to worship. What's your posture? Is your heart full when you come to the Lord's Day worship service? Do you overflow with gratitude for the God who has given you life? There's a breath in your lung and a beat in your heart. Are you giving him his due even now, especially now, when there is a virus that could snuff you out? What's your posture in worship? Are you reticent, reserved, unwilling? Do you sing the hymns with passion and meaning? Even now, when we're in our living rooms, do you sing? Or do you refuse to open your mouth in appreciation? You engage during the prayers of worship, praying as your pastor prays, praying for your pastor as your pastor prays. What's your posture? Do you thirst for the word of God to be preached? Are you looking for the message, for that application that is dependent on changing you? These women and these men in our text worship unashamed. 
It's interesting that their expression is marked by the knowledge of the scripture. It's not mindless. It's not some frivolity. It's not emotion run wild. Not at all. It's informed by the scriptures. Their crying out of Hosanna, Lord save, is incredibly familiar to Psalm 118. Let me read it to you. The psalmist writes this. I pray, save now, O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save now. That's their cry. Save from what? <laughs> what are they asking the Lord to do for them? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? For one, the military presence of Rome. These Israelites understood that their current position was so much different than what the Father had promised to them from ancient times. They were his people. He was their God. He would protect. He would provide. And he would free them from their oppressors. And here they are, still oppressed and under the bondage of Rome. And so they cry out, save us, save now. Grant us liberty. But I think there was probably something of a segment of other people there who saw beyond the physical. They cry out, Hosanna. They wave their palm fronds. And yet, there was something inside that they were echoing. They understood that their current bondage was due to Israel's sin. It had brought them to this place. And they knew that this was their far greater problem. So save now for them meant something different. Again, I wonder, on this Palm Sunday worship, for those that are listening to me just now, what, what's your desire, what's your cry like? Are you interested in being freed up from that which is inconvenient, for that which just seems to press on you and stops you from enjoying that which you own and that which you want to do? Do you even perceive that there's a need for saving in your life? Is the measure of sin something that bothers you? Many people in this culture don't really perceive that they have any need to be saved. They don't see their sin as a problem. For so many in the culture, and sadly, even for some in the church, Jesus is just someone who's rounding out their good qualities. He's someone who's knocking off the rough edges. They're doing well, thank you. They just need a little extra push to get them over the threshold of heaven. But sin, well, that's not really an issue. That's so different from the biblical perspective of these who I believe were crying out to Messiah to save. I wonder, do you, do you see that your sins, that which you have within you by nature, makes you vile and offensive to your maker? Do you see that? Do you have a sense that that's true of all men, all women, born into iniquity? In sin, my mother conceived me, the Psalms declare. It's true. Do you see that your lust and your pride and your arrogance are an affront to the holiness of your creator? And do you see that that which comes by you naturally is not just an offense against the standard of God, it's an offense against the person of God. It is not that you've stepped on his toes, it's that you've spit in his face. Do you see that with all this sin resident within you, and working through you that in the absence of a savior, your soul is destined to hell, as would be mine. If that's the case, then you join your voice with those in our story and you cry out, save now, and you recognize that your salvation is all of him and, and none of you. Well, our story is continuing quickly and Amidst this celebration, something unusual happens. It's shown up in verse 14. Follow there, would you? And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. He was so much different than what they were expecting. They're looking for the warrior king, and Jesus is coming in, not on a stallion, not the symbol of strength, but he's riding on the colt of a donkey. 
It's a fitting ride for the Prince of Peace, but so different than what they were expecting. Again, Matthew's gospel gives us just a further insight to what happens on the other side of this triumphal entry. As he makes his way in and as he dismounts from that colt, Matthew shows us this. We find Jesus weeping, of all things, over the city for her unbelief and disobedience. He says these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent her. All of this vibrant worship, all of this excitement, all of these people who were pushing up Jesus, and here he is in tears in the city of Jerusalem. Why? Well, I'm sure he was thinking of 70 AD, perhaps, when the Romans would take over the city and destroy Jerusalem, and all that he loved so much would be left as a heap of ashes. But perhaps even more, in this moment, he recognizes that those who are proclaiming his loud hosannas will in the space of some seven days be proclaiming with equally loud tones, crucify him, crucify him. They didn't understand God's plan of redemption, did they? They didn't understand the necessity of faith. They didn't understand the place of the cross or suffering or all that Christ had to do to redeem his own. Their hearts were very different than the heart of our Lord Jesus. R.C.H. Lenski writing says these words, This king, the Lord Jesus, came with grace and salvation, not to be feared and dreaded, but to be loved and trusted and joyfully followed. But no one could see that. They were expecting something so different. Well, on that note, let's look to verse 16 as our time is quickly passing. It reads this way. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. They couldn't see. The Spirit wasn't giving them insight. They couldn't see past the obvious a coming king, a liberator, someone who'll remove this oppression, someone who'll make our lives right. They could see for the physical, but not for the spiritual. They had no idea that God was at work. It's our third observation from our text. God is at work in the very place that we least expect him. That throng of excited citizens in Jerusalem, they couldn't see it. The disciples, those who were the closest to the Lord Jesus, they couldn't see it. God is at work here, I, I, I suppose. The Pharisees certainly couldn't see it. Everyone thought it would be working out so much different than it was. Can you see it this Palm Sunday, who the Lord actually is? Can you see God at work through all of this? The good and the bad, the easy and the hard, the mysterious and that which cannot be explained. God is in there working through the details. He's in the details, not the devil. How often have you failed to recognize God Almighty at work in your life, even when you were certain he was far from you, distancing himself? But he was there. God was always at work accomplishing his purposes. And the same thing is true in our story just here with his triumphal entry. The Lord Jesus is making his way in, And amidst all that he does today and all that will happen to him in the weeks to come, he knows that everything, everything must bend to the desires of his Father. This idea of God being in control, this idea of God being at work everywhere, whatever the venue, is something that the scriptures show forth again and again from the book of Genesis clear through to the book of Revelation. God is not impotent. God is strong and true and mighty. God is sovereign by all degrees. Let me remind you just quickly as we're moving through here of a couple of different citations from the scriptures which will remind us of his nature and his ability to work whatever the situation. Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, he says these words, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. 
I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. He is that one who is in the good and the bad, the light and the darkness, the easy and the calamitous. God is there. Causing the evil and the awful? No, not at all. But by his sovereign will, allowing that which we don't happen to understand. And somehow recognizing that all these things will submit to his will and way. The book of Ephesians tells us, he works all things according to the pleasure of his will. You hear the echoes of that in the psalmist who says, our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. God is at work in places that we least expect him to be. He's there. He's seeing to it that all of his plans, all of his purposes will be fulfilled to his great glory. But he's even at work not on the outside only, but on the inside as well. Here's a citation from the 19th chapter of the book of Proverbs. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. We have desires, we have motivations, and it is God himself who is directing those and causing us to take this step and this path and not another. We hear this in the book of Philippians in which we see there's an admonition for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And then when we're convinced it's solely dependent upon us, the apostle Paul writes in the very next verse, verse 13 of chapter 2, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. I thought it was about me. Oh, I see it's about God. It's about both. God sovereignly having his will work through the fallible likes of us. God is at work in places that we least expect him. It was happening that day in Jerusalem. It's happening in the present day with you and with I. He's at work in even the most awful of circumstances like a pandemic. He will redirect even these things for his purposes. And because our God is not only sovereign, but loving and good, we need not ever fear his action in our lives. Charles Spurgeon is right. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head each night. There's no miscalculation with God. There's no mistake with God. There's no failings with God. He is the sovereign one. He is our heavenly father. And he is enough for us. So remember that the next time there's a loss of opportunity and the door closes. Or there's a loss of ability. Or there's a loss of life. God is at work in the very place we were convinced he would least show up. Well, let's turn our final corner, if we could, to verses 17 and following. This triplet will put the capstone on this triumphal entry. The Bible records for us these words. The crowd that had been with him, that had been with Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. And then it speaks of a different crowd. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone out after him. Our fourth and final observation from this text is this. God will receive his glory. As we close off this story, it's really the simplest of observations because we find just two types of people here. The crowd who welcomed the Lord Jesus Christ and the Pharisees who didn't. You would think that Jesus' miracles and most notably the resurrection of Lazarus, whom they knew, would be enough to convince the Pharisees, this man is far beyond us. He's divine. Nicodemus as much says so when he shows up that night with Jesus Master, we know you're from God. No one does the kinds of works that you do except he is from God. But these Pharisees just here weren't buying in. They heard, as the scripture declares in verse 17, the crowd who had been with Jesus at the resurrection kept bearing witness. 
but they wouldn't believe. The Pharisees had made up their mind, irrespective of what they saw, they would never believe. To do so would have cost them everything. They would have lost their position. They would have lost their power. And they would have lost their pride. But God will receive his glory. It's an interesting thing how bitterness can raise up in a heart and not only obscure clear vision, but can ruin a person from the inside out. That's what's happened with these men. Great academicians, doctorates in the Mosaic law, but they knew the Bible just for the sake of knowing the Bible and not for the sake of looking for what the message of the Bible had for them, their Messiah. And so they became hard and cold and they were filled with laws and regulations and as we said earlier, not the hint of grace. One commentator describing the background that led to this says of the Pharisees, this dark background of hate in the hearts of all the leaders in Jerusalem makes the scene of the triumphal entry that much more compelling. I think that's an interesting comment. We look to the Pharisees and their strife and their hardness. And this commentator says, as we see them in stark relief to the Lord Jesus, it makes the triumphal entry and all that it is to us by way of this text that much more compelling. Compelling for who? Compelling for us, the readers. You see, unlike the Pharisees and those of Jesus' time, we read this text, we know this story, in the light of knowing and realizing who Jesus really is. He is the glory of the Father. So as we close this message, and knowing that God will receive his glory, I ask you this Palm Sunday, are you open to worship the one who alone is worthy? For God will not be undone. He will get his glory. And so, Jesus rides into Jerusalem to fill, fulfill God's plan of redemption in the space of a week. Everything will be changed. He will offer himself up as a sacrifice for sin. He will rise victorious over the grave. He will grant new life to any who look to him in faith. And my final question then is to you. Will it be you this Palm Sunday? Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father, even as we have with feeble hands and hearts dealt with this text, I trust that the power and presence of the Holy Spirit would work within us and would change us, that we would love the Lord Jesus and that we would obey him, that we would seek him out in a biblical sense, that we would look, oh God, for his working in places where we least expect it, and that ultimately we would give you your glory. And we pray, O oh Father, that what we have said and done has been for that glory and that glory alone. And we ask this in the name of Christ, our King who saves us. Amen. Our closing hymn that I hope you'll join with me in singing is Hosanna, Loud Hosanna.
Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you this day in worship. As we continue through this week, I want to encourage you to be faithful. Remember Christ's church with your tithes and offerings. It's so important. Remember to be faithful with those around you in your family or your neighbors or those you meet out and about. Remember to be faithful to tell them they need not fear but to put their trust in the Lord. And remember to be faithful in seeking God's face in his word in prayer and again each week in worship. And now receive God's benediction over you, his people. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father Almighty, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell within you now and forevermore. Amen.